Good morning. If you've got your Bibles and you'd like to turn with me, we're going to be studying from the book of Luke, chapter 13, in just a moment. While you're turning there, I got to just make a little confession to you. I, I generally struggle with what to preach about after there's been a gospel meeting. I just do. Huh? Yeah, it's just, you know, you, you've got somebody that's come in and they've preached lessons that they've put together. And generally, not always, but generally they've prepared them before. And they really get a chance to show you some of the great things that they've studied and they've tested them on audiences. And then, you know, you, you don't get the chance to really do that. And not only that, but personally, I really enjoy listening to Ralph Walker. He has been a mentor of mine for years. And so to come behind not only someone who did a good job, but also someone that you respect, you just kind of get up here and go, well, it's just me today. <laughs> and then it's, it's raining outside. And so you kind of got that little bit of white noise that shh, that's back there. And it's a little bit cool in the building. And some of you I see have blankets on. I mean, you're just ready to go right to sleep. I can, I can tell already that it's just, you know, it's just waiting to happen. So John Hunt gave me some advice. He said, listen, if you preach for just 15 minutes, they'll forget all about all that. <laughs> Not today. <laughs> Can only hope. We've been really busy the last month or so. We were traveling uh, in July. And then we come back and things are already in motion for us to start school. It's a busy week. In fact, this last week was really the first full week of school for us. It may have been about the same for you. And you may have, with your kids, you've got band practice and all the other things or football practice or what have you that goes along with the start of school. And so it's kind of busy for us. And I didn't get the chance to say it. It's been on my heart and my mind. But I haven't told you guys happy anniversary from the beginning of July. It's been three years. Three years, starting on four for me to be here. And so with that in my mind and in my heart, it's something I've been thinking about. I want to address it with you. I want to look at this at least through a different slant, maybe. And look at this parable of the, of the fig tree. Because it's not just something that's been on my heart about, you know, how effective are you working with this group? And are they working with you? And I mean, it's just something that you should constantly keep in check. Every once in a while, you just go and check and see if you're bearing fruit. And that's the, the mindset that I have this morning when I invite you to this particular passage. It's just to kind of do a check and to see where we are as a congregation, individually. How are we working together? And could we say, yes, there's fruit and no, or no, there isn't? And if, in fact, there's some things that may need to change about that. So without going back over what Brother Humphrey read to us this morning, I want to kind of go back into this and, and give you a preface. If you go back to... So Luke chapter 13 and the first several verses leading up to verse 6 through 9. On this same occasion, there were some present who reported to Christ about the Galileans who Pilate had mingled blood, uh, had mingled blood with their sacrifices. And he answered and said to them, do you suppose that these Galileans were greater sinners than other Galileans because they suffered this fate? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or do you suppose that those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them were worse culprits than all the other men who lived in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And with that as a background, he then goes into this parable of a fig tree. And tells them, listen, there's someone that came and checked their fig tree and there wasn't any fig tree. So he talks with the guy that's the gardener and says, listen, this, I, this isn't doing us any good. We need to cut this thing down. He goes, well, no, wait a minute. You know, there's a couple things we can do and just be sure, give it a little more time. And so with the thought process of repentance in Luke chapter 13 in the first several verses where he says, I tell you, you need to repent or you're going to perish. He follows that with this. There's some preparation that needs to be made. Now, when you look at this, the implications seem fairly simple. This isn't one of the longer parables. This isn't like the parable of the soils where you're walking through and you're going, okay, well, this one means this and this one means that. This is really fairly simple. So this one slide we're going to get through and you're going to go, oh, that was pretty easy. I mean, look at it. 
He's saying in this particular parable that as the vine dresser, uh, the, uh, sorry, as the field owner comes and look at it, he says time enough has been given. You've had three years with this particular tree. Now, I'm not a, a fig treeologist. Okay, I don't specialize in fig trees. So I had to do a little homework. And from what I understand from those people that work with fig trees, they say that a fig tree will probably take a little longer than most trees to start producing fruit. It takes anywhere from three to six years before it will begin to produce fruit, depending on the particular breed of that particular tree. So for him to come at this tree and say, listen, I've, I've been growing this tree for three years and it hasn't produced fruit, it may be a little bit early. And you could say, well, you know, it's expected though, at three years, all the other ones are doing it. And so time has been given. It may be that the field owner had bought this three years before and, and he's had all these trees and so this tree may be older than three years. It's possible. We don't know. It's not given. But suffice it to say that time enough has been given so that they would both recognize, listen, this tree should be producing fruit. The trees around it are producing fruit. It has been through the same droughts. It has been through the same floods. It has been through the same sunshine and rain. Why isn't it producing fruit? And he just says, well, I guess it's just not going to. So let's just cut it down. Time enough has been given. Well, the other thing is that not only has enough time gone by, but there's a certain expectation that something would happen. It's not that he's, he found some fruit and it wasn't any good. In verse 6, it says, he came looking for fruit and didn't find any. Now, again, I'm not a fig treeologist, but so I had to look. There's an early fig and a late fig on most trees. And so when he comes to look, he's anticipating even in the early figs that would come at the spring part of the year, that they wouldn't necessarily be the best ones to eat. If you were going to save them or preserve them, those are generally the ones that they would use from what I understand. But he didn't even find those. He didn't even find ones that maybe the locust, he didn't find nothing. And so the expectation is there's not even, it's not even coming close to what it is I would like to have happen. And so he says, cut it down. Now someone steps in, the, vine, the vineyard keeper says, he says, I, I, we need to do something. He goes, well, leave it alone, sir, and I'll dig around it and I'll put fertilizer on it. And then next year we'll know. Last chance. <laughs> How many of you have ever been given a last chance? No, I mean, I, mean, I mean a real last chance. Don't you start raising your hand if you said, if your mama said, I'm going to give you one more chance. Now listen, I mean it. I'm going to give you one more last chance. That doesn't count. I mean one last chance. Well, you know this is it. Whatever may happen next, it's what we say is do or die. If it ain't happening, it ain't going to happen. We're cutting it down. We're moving on. That's, that's a very serious point, whatever it is. How much more so than when Jesus begins to use this parable and say, if this doesn't happen, we're going to cut down this tree. We're looking for something. Now, I want to I tell you one more thing for, that I learned from the fig treeologist, and then I'll move. When this particular thing would happen with a tree, they would dig around it and fertilize it because they wanted to almost over -fer fertilize it, just to make it produce. The figs that would come out wouldn't necessarily even be edible because they're overproduced. Sometimes they would get so much that they would begin to produce and then they would all drop at once because they weren't exactly right. That's, that's what I'm told. And so he says, listen, it's got to produce something. We're going to give it all we got, let it produce something. And it may not be a long lasting thing. In fact, we're going to put so much work in this that sometimes these trees will take another year or two to recover from the work we're going to do to it. We're going to put so much effort into it. This is the last time. Now, the applications for this passage then are not necessarily as easy because then we begin saying, okay, now... We've got to make the application. Not only was this written for those there that needed to repent, but there's something to be said for us. There's something to be said as we look at ourselves and go, all right, now what needs to change here? Well, first of all is this. We need to understand that growth is a process. 
Growth is a process. There are things that take time and resources and care. And in that vineyard, that's, that's what the two men are talking about. Listen, I've come inspecting this thing for how long? Three years. For him, that was enough time to know whether or not that was going to happen. There are certain things that we'll get involved in and we don't know whether or not something's working or it's not working. I used to work in the marketing field and the, the joke was, well, you, you know that your marketing is working for you, right? But it's only half of it working. And the problem is you don't know which half. So you got to just keep kind of trying to do everything. Because it takes time and resources and you've got to funnel down and target and all those other sort of things that go into marketing. We could probably say that about a lot of different things. It just takes time and resources, energy and care. And it is a process. I can't tell you how many times it's happened with, with my children. And I know you parents have had this happen with your children where they say to you, man, I can't wait to be big. I, I want to be big, Dad. And then they go away to camp and they come back and you're like, wow, it happened in a week. Well, it didn't really happen in a week. You just noticed it. Our family pictures from one year to the next, you don't anticipate it, but then you see those pictures, those school pictures, and wow, there was a process going on. We have to understand that spiritually growth is a process. And it takes time and resources and care for us to grow. I say that to say because some, some of you may be frustrated with where you're at spiritually. Or something that you've been really working on for a while and you think, man, this just isn't happening. You know, I really wanted it to happen a lot sooner. Listen, life happens. Things distress the things that we plant. Sometimes they get sun time. Sometimes they get rain. Sometimes they get drought. Sometimes they get flood. And it takes constant care and nurturing for those things to produce fruit. But the other thing is this. How are we using the resources we've been given then? If we're going to say that growth is a process and it takes these things being poured in, how are we using them? Because the owner says, I've been putting these things in there. I mean, there's dirt all around it. It ought to grow. <laughs> if it's just that, right? You'd think it would just be enough dirt. There's soil, rain, there's pruning, there's attention. Hey, listen, there, there may be bugs that need to be knocked off of it. There's time. How are we using our respective resources? The things that we are planted in. The ways that we've been trimmed. Listen, nobody wants to go out, or a few of you, like to go out into the rain. But you know what? The rain nurtures us, doesn't it? If nothing else, it cleanses things. But not only that, we need the, the nutrients that come in the rain that come up. So th those things are fed to us. And they're not always pleasant. How are you using the resources that have been given to you? Because that's the question here. These, these trees have gone through that. This particular one has had about the same as the other ones. Only different by the space. How is it using? Well, there's no fruit. So at the end of the day, it's not paying off. Well, then what? Well, then we have to ask the question, well, when is it going to happen? When will we produce? If it's not now, if it's a process, fine. If it's a matter of resources, fine. But there comes a point where we have to say, listen, are we producing or not? I mean, we can say, well, we need another year. Well, we need another year. Well, this is happening. But at some point we ask the question, is this productive or not? In the investment industry, we refer to it as a return on investment. And so the owner says, listen, there's no return on my investment in this tree. Get rid of it. So we have to acknowledge patience at first. There's going to be time, there is going to be a process, there is going to be an investment before those things start coming out. But get this folks, we can't walk around using the excuse, well it just takes time, well it just takes time, because there is a production in the end that is expected. Something's got to happen. And it is not only fair for us to do that, it is right for us to examine the things that go on in this congregation and in our own lives and families to say, are we producing what we ought to be producing? 
Are we bearing spiritual fruit? Now when Paul lists the fruit of the Spirit, that's not the only fruit of the Spirit, is it? And there are several things that we could talk about. Paul will talk about in Romans chapter 1. He'll say, listen, I want to bear fruit among you. Well, I don't necessarily think he's only referring to love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. In fact, in that particular one, I think he's talking about converting people. Towards the end of the book of Romans, he'll say, listen, there is a, a, a fruit or a gift that I'm taking to those who are poor. And it's those, it's those gifts that you have given. It's a bearing of fruit that we're going to share with other people. So it can happen in a variety of ways with, depending on our talents. But we do have to ask, are the results happening? And if at some point we need to stop doing something and then do something better or just say, listen, we are really going to put our effort into this to make a change because this is what needs to happen. These are the fruits that need to come about. Then we need to do that. And so that brings me about to a sense of urgency. A sense of urgency that I don't know about you, but that I sometimes lack. If we're going to say that results are expected, and we say, well, there is going to be a time where, we say, where we're going to check, and if there's no fruit, then we're going to move on. Then should there be a sense of urgency? I mean, I think so. I don't know that everything has to be urgent. But I do think we need to have a sense of urgency about what we're trying to produce. If we need to be producing more Christians, that is, if we need to be going out and teaching other people, then there needs to be a sense of urgency about that. If we need to be giving more, there needs to be a sense of urgency about that. If we just need to be working individually on more joy in our lives, then we need to have a sense of urgency about that because you need to understand the ramifications. You don't have forever. Yes, we can say tomorrow has always come. But we still need to be working. It still needs to mean something because there are those that we have had, even among us, who did not get tomorrow at some point. And do you know what? There's going to be a day where you don't get tomorrow. And so you need to understand the ramifications of not working. And how many of you have ever had something that you really worked hard on? And you thought, man, we did all that work for nothing. All that work, and here it is, I could have done that. I, I'm probably the only person that really has been in that sort of exercise in futility. But can you imagine in this particular one, man, we did all this work, we did all this thing around this tree, we fertilized it, we pruned it, we carried attention to it. We gave this tree more attention than any other tree in the valley. And it still didn't produce all that work for nothing. I don't want it to be said about me when I stand before the Lord, I, we did all that work. I sent my son, I surrounded you with Christian people, you lived in the greatest nation to ever exist. All that work for nothing. You have everything supplied for you. You have video cameras and PowerPoints and Bibles and electronic Bible devices and all those other sort of things at your fingertips. And for what? All that work for nothing. The application is hard, isn't it? Where is our sense of urgency to grow and to produce? And so here's what I want you to get when you begin to be come down to the end of it is that unfruitfulness will not be tolerated. Listen, I don't want to cross out God's grace here. But that's not this sermon. Okay, so be fair with me there. Unfruitfulness is not going to be tolerated. He says, if it doesn't produce fruit, cut it down. And that's not the only place. When Jesus will talk about being the vine and we are the branches, he'll say that if you abide in me, that you will bear fruit in John 15. And if you don't, those that don't bear fruit are going to be what? Cut off and thrown into the fire. In Romans chapter 11, the same sort of message is given there that if you are grafted into this, this, uh, this olive tree. That's the illustration there. 
He says that you are allowed to come in, but listen, if you're going to come in and, and act out and you're not going to behave the way that Christ, you'll be cut off. You'll be cast in the fire too. And he says that's the way God works. It is his grace and it is also his justice. And the same sort of message in Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1 to 8. Over and over and over again, we are told that we need to bear fruit and that not bearing fruit is not tolerated. I get it. His grace will cover us. There is mercy at the cross, I know. But we are also not going to continue in sin that grace may abound. To say, well, I don't have to do anything. Someone else will take care of it. Someone else will teach the Bible class. Someone else will volunteer. Someone else will do this. Someone else will do that. Haven't we hired it done? It's not right. So, now when you're looking at your sheet, you're thinking, wow, that's it. Some of you even now are folding it up. We're not done. I've got a couple thought questions I want to give you. You can fill them in in that bottom spot, bottom spot on your paper, or you can fill them in in that, those little applications. But I've got three and then we'll be done. Three of them. I want you to seriously ask yourself, what areas of my life need to be fertilized? I may be producing in this aspect or this aspect over here, but there's a part of my life that is not producing fruit. And I need to work on it. There are talents and abilities and skills that I have that are lying dormant. And they look nice. They got the leaves. No fruit. What sort of sense of urgency do you have to say, I have got to produce here? Yes, I can do better. You know, one of the hardest things that I, that I he have heard from those that would mentor me, whether it's my parents or coaches or anyone else, is when you do something and you know you haven't done it to the best of your ability, and they look at you and they say, you're better than that. You just totally sloughed off, and you're better than that. I don't know who needs to hear that this morning, but if that needs to echo in your ears, let it echo. You're better than that. What area needs to be fertilized and where can you do better? What resources am I wasting? What resources am I just wasting? And especially those of us in this nation could really write a long list, couldn't we? What resources am I wasting? And it doesn't necessarily have to be our time. doesn't necessarily have to be our money, although those things are included. But I want you to just take a second and look around. Go ahead, look around. I know it's kind of weird because we don't do that a whole lot. But yeah, just go ahead, look at each other. Because you have a lot of resources just sitting here. You have people here. I, I know I joke sometimes about, you know, hey, let's go to lunch and you can buy me lunch. I, I, I joke about that. But you make a mistake thinking that the people in this room don't, well, they wouldn't understand. They've never been through it before. They wouldn't listen to me. You make a mistake of wasting the resources that we have in just each other. Listen, just look around. There are groups that I have worked with and even many that I have not that would love to be sitting in a group of 250 people here to worship and praise the Lord and to have them at their disposal and say, listen, I need you to encourage me or I want to encourage you. And that's just this group. And let me say this, that's really what your elders are trying to get you to see. I don't know if you've picked up on this, those of you that are members here and have been for the last couple of years, but haven't we talked quite a bit about the church and the people? We had a class on it, and when Brother Walker came to speak to us, you notice he spoke on the church? And some of you may remember that the last time Brother Walker was here, what did he talk about? The church. 
And, and when Brother Walker came even up the road to Skyview, do you know what he talked about? The church. And our elders said, you know what? We still need to hear that here. We still need these people to understand who they are as God's people. We want them to get it. They're trying to fertilize you. Don't let it go wasted. They're trying to under, help you to understand who you are as the people of God. Pick that up. Because the shepherds here are saying, listen, in their prayers, maybe not like this, but they are saying, Lord, don't cut this group down. Let us fertilize it and let us produce fruit. They want to see it. And they're not the only ones. They want to see it. And the last one is this, is the master tired of waiting on me for fruit? I cannot imagine that, but that was something that came to me as I was putting this together. Is Christ, is God tired of waiting on me? Because that's the picture here. And even in the later instance, whenever he will curse the fig tree because there is no fruit on it. When Jesus will do that, he said, listen, I gave you the chance and you didn't. He'll cry over Jerusalem and said, how often I would have welcomed you back that you could be my people and you would not. And is God standing there going, listen, I'm about done. There is a cup of God's wrath that if it isn't full, it is filling for those who will not obey him. And you need to consider that. And boy, so do I. Well, you may say, well, I'm not rebelling against the Lord. I want to tell you something. It's not just a time to be planted, folks. It is a time to bear fruit. It is a time to start producing. And we cannot say someone else will do it. I leave you with this scripture. Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 9 says this. Whomever is slack in his work is a brother to him that destroys. It may be that you're saying, well, I'm not tearing down God's people. But right now I'm just, I'm just not producing. Okay. You need to understand... You're not helping build it up. If we are God's temple, if we, his people, are living stones, if we are his vineyard, then it's time for us to work together and produce fruit. Amen? Amen. Pray with me this morning, please. Our Father God, we're mindful of the task that you lay in front of not only your people as you were speaking to them in the first century but even as you, your words echo to us now we need to be bearing fruit and every one of us myself at the forefront needs to understand we stand before a vine dresser an owner of a field who knows us and knows the fruit that we can produce. We ask, Father, that you would help us in taking up the resources that are all around us in the soil and in the nutrients that metaphorically speak to the things that we have at our disposal, the fertilizer, the rain, and help us to take it in and produce the fruit that you would have us. Each to our own ability, and each strengthen ourselves in you. We do not want to be the vineyard, nor do we want to be the tree that is not productive. And Father, if we examine ourselves and find an illness, a shortcoming, to the extent that it needs to be healed or pruned, we pray that we would do that for each other and that you would strengthen us as we nourish and help each other through the way. We are a people that want to do what's right. And we beg you for your aid, even now. We 
have no way to ask these things except through Jesus Christ who died for us. And so we appeal to him, our sacrifice, even now. And all God's people said, Amen. Well, it may be this morning that you have not been planted in the vineyard. That while you're among the trees, you are not yet part of the body of Christ. We would love for you to do that this morning. We'd love to have you baptized. If you understand what that means. If you understand what that means. If you understand that that means that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That he is man and God in flesh and that it's greater than I could ever explain to you. But that he came and lived on this earth and you're willing to confess him as your Lord and Savior and repent of your sins and live correctly. And you're willing to unite with him in the waters of baptism. That's what that is. And you're willing to come up and live a new life. We would love that. And the only thing that we would love more is if there was a child of God today that was here that hadn't been living right and wanted to start new. If there was anybody here that in their heart and their mind said, I can do better than what I'm doing and I need someone to pray with me, that that's, that's it, that's here. You are among the trees. You are in God's vineyard and we would love to pray with you and for you. Would that there was anything else that we could help you with, we will do our best with God as our strength. But we would like to do that for you on his behalf. Will you come to the front now while we stand and while we sing to encourage you? Why do you...